those folks. We're turning our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, and as you're turning there, I want to just say, uh, I want to recognize a couple people. We have at our church something that we call spiritual life coaching. It's kind of like a one-on-one discipleship uh, time. This is what the book looks like. It looks kind of thick and scary, but there's a lot of space to write in it, and some different things. About 10 weeks that people go through uh, just to help uh, others grow in their faith, uh, to be strengthened, kind of foundational truths uh, about God's Word and our relationship with Jesus Christ, but just a wonderful uh, resource that we have to help uh, people grow uh, in their faith. Uh, I just pulled out the table of contents here uh, where uh, things a- answers questions like, can I ever lose my salvation? Uh, how do I study my Bible? Uh, how can I be filled with the Spirit? I should have read that before today's message. That might have been a help. Uh <laughs> Why should I be in a small group? And I'm just randomly picking out. There's 10 weeks, five days in each week. Uh, but we've had, had a number of people over the last year or so that have been through this book uh, and have been uh, kind of growing their faith, if you will, and taking people through this. Uh, and then also really establishing the faith of many uh, as they're new to Christianity or maybe you've never really dug in to some of those things of the Bible and had a, a solid foundation for this is not just what the Bible says, but this is. This is what I believe because it's here uh, in the Bible and having an opportunity to work through that. So uh, we had uh, a couple ladies that finished uh, this book this week. And these these folks, uh, these ladies, uh, I would say my opinion is they've they've done this more for, hey, we want to grow in in the word of God. But it's more about, hey, we want to go through this so that we can uh, help others and we can grow in that place and look for the opportunity to encourage uh, someone else. And that is Deborah Ogle and April Small. And then Crystal as well. Crystal didn't make a card for her. She only made one for you two ladies. But So I keep calling her out. She didn't, some, I don't think she wanted her name mentioned maybe uh, in this service. But let, can we just give those ladies a round of applause? Right. I, I believe that the height of spiritual maturity is not that you know all the beast in Revelation. All right. Now, if that's your thing, that's your jam, you like that stuff. Great. It's in the Bible. It's biblical. I think it's good to study and healthy. But I, I really believe that the height of spiritual maturity is recognizing that the Christian life that you've been given by Christ is to be used to help others, to serve others, to grow their faith. Uh, just like 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2 tells us. Uh, and so when people are doing that, when people are being equipped to do that, I think there's nothing greater, no greater place of service uh, that someone can have in what God is doing uh, in, in, in our world than by helping establish the faith of other people. So thank you ladies so much uh, for doing that. And, and I know there's other people that are working through that uh, at this time. This is part two because I got carried away last week. Uh, I got right stuck in the middle of the message and I thought, man, I could blur through the back half. But the truth is, is what we are talking about today, about how to be filled with the spirit. What does that mean? What does it look like? How do I do it uh, in my life? It is, it is so revolutionary uh, to our Christian life. It is, it maybe revolutionary is the word. It is so essential to our Christian life. It sort of seems like something that should come quite naturally, uh, that should just kind of happen automatically. I'm a Christian. I go to church. I serve in the nursery. I help with Kids City. I do the teens. I, uh, I invite my neighbor. Doesn't those sort of things fill me with the Spirit? Now, here's what I think. Here's what the Bible teaches. Maybe that's a better way to say it. Those things really are fruit of being filled with the Spirit. And um, they are maybe evidence of obedience to the Spirit. Hey, I feel like God directed me to do this. I'm going to do it. It it can prove uh, that I'm filled with the Spirit. It can be a fruit of that. But the truth is, if we're not careful... Uh, we can do the right thing for the wrong reason. Why did you give that money in the offering plate? I'd ask my third grade self. I still remember that $5 I whipped out of the plate and so gloriously dropped into the offering plate. (laughs) I did it so my parents would be impressed. What if my parents didn't notice? I'm not giving my next $5 unless I get a pat on the back, unless I get an attaboy, you know what I'm saying? And you see how this is, I could serve in the nursery. Why? So the pastor will make you the volunteer of the week? You know what I mean? Like, and, and like, no, I would never do that. But like, maybe it's like inside sometimes we do that. We all do. We're all guilty of that. Preacher included. Like I'm doing this 
and someone sees, and man, I'm, I'm ready to go, and like, I'll do it again. Right thing, wrong reasons, not filled with the Spirit. See what I'm saying? So and what that produces isn't someone that bleeds orange, if I can say it like that in our city-like context. What that will produce over time is burnt orange, all right? That's going to produce burnout. That's going to, oh, forget it. It's not worth it. It wasn't as fun as it used to be. I don't get as much recognition as I thought I would. I'm not on the inside of that group that I was trying to endeavor to get in, and I just quit. I just give up. I just walk away. Burn orange, all right? That's not what we want, all right? Over time, over a decade, over two decades, over three decades, however long God has us here and has us doing uh, what he's doing has a shining for him in our everyday life. It is so vitally important that we are filled with the Spirit. Because what happens then is that we do the right thing for the right reasons. We do the right things with the right motivation. Hey, I don't really care who sees. I don't really care how they respond. I don't care if they throw me in jail, says the Apostle Paul. I don't care if they run me out of town. I'm doing this because the, the love of Christ constrains me, because the, the truth and the reality uh, in the spiritual realm, what I find in God's Word, what I find from the Spirit is enough for me to do what I do because I see it so clearly from God's Word. I'm filled with His power. I'm filled with His presence. So I obey, and I do, not the opposite, which here's the thing. For me, I, I can't speak for you, but for me, I think I've lived so much of my Christian life backwards. Trying to establish, trying to, well, what does it take to be filled with the Spirit? Well, obviously I have to go to church. <laughs> obviously I have to read my Bible. Obviously I have to have a ministry. Obviously I have to tithe. Obviously I have to, and, and, I, and I, I get a good list, you know, like seven, eight, nine, ten things that are really like, you know, things I'm good at. <laughs> And I don't want to pick things I'm not good at because that would be like, uh, that would be hard. You know, like because I don't get these things that I'm comfortable with, that I grew up with, that I'm you know, good with. And like, this is what it means to be filled with the Spirit. But the problem is making a list like that is, is you only include a few things. What about the 84,000 things you left off the list? What about anger? You know, <laughs> what about pride? What about selfishness? Does that not kind of, you, you see the problem we can if we kind of do this backwards and make sort of, well, obviously this is, you know, I'll do this, 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 and then I'll be filled with the Spirit. That's not the way this works. In fact, we have to be filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit produces the fruit. The Spirit leads in his, through, God, through God's will and through His Word to make, you know, do this and do that. Now, should I read my Bible? Yes. Should I go to church? For sure. Should I give uh, to what God's doing through my local church? Yes, it's a, it's a command of the scripture. All those things should be done. But if they're done out of duty, if they're done to try to develop your own self-righteousness or somehow to elevate your place where you think God's impressed with you, you'll burn out. You will not last because you're doing it in your own strength. And so it's so crucial, it's so key that we get this because we have to be powered by the Spirit. Uh, we, we have to be filled with the Spirit. We have to, John 15 says, abide in Christ. For without me, you can do nothing. And we can come, we could be here, we could have our bodies present, we could accomplish a task, we could check the mark uh, on the box uh, next to the, to the line item. But the fact is, what does it really profit if I'm just running around showing people how impressive I am and how many spiritual disciplines I possess? I'm running around trying to get attention for me instead of for God. And so it's important that we are filled with the Spirit. Our core values of our church is that we want to walk with our Savior. But we can make a list. How do we do that exactly? We got a fancy little picture, I think, of that. How do we walk with our Savior? There, you know, read my Bible, pray. You know, and and we, can, we can make a longer list of some of the things that it involves. But when we, the second we start turning that into a list, like check, 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 that, well, that means I'm walking with Jesus. No, like you can read your Bible and not walk with Jesus. You can pray and not pray. <laughs> you know, you can, you, can, uh, you can come to church and not be here. So, but when I'm filled with the Spirit, when I have things on uh, in the right order, then those things like reading my Bible and being in church and listening to preaching, then those things help me walk with my Savior. Believe in growing with my group. You can be involved in city groups. There are people involved in city groups. 
that are no better off for being involved in it. Like spiritually, individually, spiritually for yourself. You're doing it for the wrong reason. You're doing it out of social obligation. You're doing it because you know I check the attendance uh, every week. You're doing it because your spouse is making you. And eventually you're going to burn out. We've got to figure out how do we get filled with the Spirit so that we can uh, bleed this in our life. It's a natural thing, just like breathing, because I'm powered by the Spirit. Meeting with the church, sharing uh, with the world, loving with our light, leading with our lives. These are the core things that make up the uniqueness of City Light Baptist Church. But it is so important that they are motivated properly. Otherwise, they will work, they'll only work for a little bit. It'll kind of give out the, the right idea, but it will eventually sputter out. It will eventually burn. It will eventually die. And so it's important that we figure out Ephesians 5.18. Ephesians 5.18 says, Be filled, or be not drunk with wine with an excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Friends, this is a command. It's not an option. You think about a command and a couple things as one, it needs to be done. Because there's times when it's not done. Hey, when you get saved, the Bible says the Holy Spirit indwells you, comes and lives inside of you. He is in there, okay? But he isn't necessarily filling the place. He indwells, but he doesn't fill. How do we understand that? How, how do we make sense of that? I, I used all these pictures. If you weren't here last week, you're like, what are they doing with the decor? Who hired a new interior decorator? Uh, like, don't ever let Jenny not come to church two weeks in a row ever again. Uh, as she recovers from her surgery, Matt does weird stuff. No, uh, this wall, these walls up here kind of represent for us the walls of my mind, the walls of my heart, the walls of my thinking. And uh, we have some verses up here this week, and that's because uh, we took this sign uh, down from over there. It said, do what makes you happy. I mean, I bought this last week, and the lady that I bought it from at Hobby Lobby, she said, oh, I like that one. And she thought that was great. It's a, it's a good way to live your life. And I said, oh, I just want to preach to her. Uh, but I, you know, I didn't. Uh, and we took that down off the wall of my heart, and we put this up instead. And, and the truth is, this is a random verse that is the one that they were selling at the store. You could pick a thousand verses to put up there to replace this lie, okay, this wrong way to live your life, with something that's real, truthful, eternal, uh, that has a point and will actually work. Over here we had this sign, my garage, my tools, my rules. And it was over there. And we took that one down and we put up a verse, just a random verse that we bought at the store. But you could take a thousand of them and put in the, in the place of there. You see, when we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives with his suitcase, if you will. And he opens up shop. He puts up a little sign. I found the one whom my soul loves. And he, he indwells us. Man, we know Jesus loves us. He died for us, and so I love him too. Uh, and he died and forgave my sins. He's going to take me to heaven uh, one day, and I love him for that. And he indwells me. The spirit of the Christ lives in me. But the truth is, he doesn't fill my life. I've got a lot of baggage. I've got decades of misinformation that hang all over the walls of my heart. I got ways... <laughs> And, and practices and philosophies and uh, thoughts that I operate in my worldview and I exist in and I goals and dreams and visions that I, that I live for that have nothing to do with God. They have nothing to do with the Spirit. In fact, they have everything to do with me and excluding God and saying no to Him. I don't do my thing, what makes me happy. It's my garage, my room. But Ephesians chapter 5 says it, it kind of confronts this issue because as we are saved and indwelt by the Spirit, now over the rest of my life, it's the Spirit's project to redecorate the walls of my heart. It's the Spirit's job to point me to Jesus through the Word of God to show me, remind me, and keep reminding me why His way is better than my way. Why he is sufficient. Why he is all that I need. Instead of being filled with me, or filled with the world, or filled with my flesh, or filled with the things that the devil would provide for me as substitutes for Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit wants to fill me with the truth of God's word that would be the basis for my behavior. It would be the foundation for my life. 
It, it would be the framework by which I view uh, the world and why, uh, what I put on my goals and dreams and ambitions on top of would be this truth that we find laid out for us in what we call the Bible. So we're commanded to be filled uh, with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit means, uh, it, means it requires that I'm emptied of self. I've got to take my things off the wall. I've got to move my things out of the house so that the Spirit can come in. And to be filled with the Spirit requires that I be filled with the Scriptures. Not just empty of self. Oh, I can't do that. can't do that. can't do that. I'm against that. Don't believe that. Don't believe that. Like, let's get all this stuff out of here. Well, what are we going to put in this place? We've got to put the right things back in place. And those are, we'll refine those right things. It's going to come uh, from the Scriptures. As we hope in them. We talked last week about Romans 15, 13, which says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. That is, there's a, it's not just, oh, I read my Bible, and does that mean I'm filled with the Spirit? No, it means that what the Spirit reveals to you about Jesus in the Bible, that we believe. Uh, not, not just in our head, like, we're, oh, I believe that. I agree with that. I think that. But that we believe it enough to live our life like it's real. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he, we must believe that he is and that he rewards those that diligently seek him. Those that obey his word. Those that live like the, the, the book that he miraculously preserved uh, for us and we hold in our hands today like it matters. Like it's important. Like it's the way everybody should live their life. Because it is. By faith, I obey God's word. I talked to someone. Uh, I love this guy. And we talk a lot after service. And he says, man... I wish I could be a fly on your wall. I'm like, I don't know. I don't have that impressive wall. So, you know, like it's, it's, not, it's not probably what it seems like. I said, but he's like, he was just saying, I, could, I, I would love to sit down and just help me. I've got this situation with this guy at my work. I have this situation with the guy at my work, and I, I, I want to know uh, how, to, how, to, how to handle him. And so we just kind of talked through the message just again. I said, here's a specific situation. Here's how you want to do this. I said, imagine this guy, he, tomorrow morning when you see him, he is walking up to you with a sign that says, so-and-so isn't going to be happy unless, he's nice, unless I'm nice to him. And he put, you know, he's, going to put that, he's going to want to put that sign on your neck. And you're going to have to refuse to let that sign hang on your neck. To say, Matt isn't going to be happy unless that guy's nice to me. He's a jerk. He's been a jerk for weeks. He's going to, guess what? No surprise, he's going to go to work tomorrow. He's going to be a jerk. I guess what he's going to do. So when he walks up with that sign and wants to put it around your neck so you have to carry it around all day, refuse it and say, no, I've got God's love. I've got God's grace. I've got the Holy Spirit. I believe that I can, I can be happy. I can be nice. I can be kind. I can be generous. I can be loving. Not because this guy approves or this guy sees me as valuable or this guy lets me in on the circle. It's because of what God has done for me, who I am in Jesus Christ, and refuse the sign. And let the word of God be the thing that hangs around our neck. Let the word of God be the thing that hangs around on the walls of our hearts. Someone said to me this week, they said, Pastor Matt, let's talk about being filled with the Spirit and being having joy. And the truth is, I'm just, I'm not that kind of person. I'm not overly happy. I'm just not a very bubbly personality. And I, <laughs> I said, have you seen me? You know, like, I'm not really uh, all that bubbly in my, I don't know that anybody's ever described me as bubbly, you know? Uh, I, and, you know, so I want you to understand, and, and I, I, I try to shoot straight with you every week. I don't want to get up here and pretend uh, like, hey, if you obey this verse, whoa, you know, the angels are going to sing and, you know, all this thing's going to happen. Like, because this is just real life on earth. And so I, I try to be real and paint the correct picture. But please understand me uh, that to have the joy of the Lord in your life doesn't necessarily mean you just got a big smile. Someone pokes you in the eye and go, oh, please do the other one. This will be fun. Like. Uh, no, like, that's, that's not what I mean, okay? That's not what I mean. In fact, you can see in Jesus' life, who was always filled with the Spirit, uh, you can see times in the Bible where he cried. Lazarus died, and Jesus wept. He cried. Was he filled with the Spirit? Yes. Was he in living in obedience to, to God? Yes. Uh, and was he doing the right things? Yes. But he was also sad. Paul was a man who wrote most of the New Testament. He was 
filled uh, with the Spirit, but not always, because he's a human being just like we were. The Bible says that Paul, uh, he said, we contend, we strive to work to have joy in suffering, joy in sorrow. And, and this is the amazing thing about Christianity. This is the amazing thing about uh, the Spirit and, and, and God's Word is that we can have a joy even in a sad time. We can, we can go to a funeral and have joy. Why? Because of the hope that's been filled up in our hearts. Where do we get that hope? Well, from the Bible. How do we understand that? That's what the Bible says. Because of the Spirit of God that lives in us, that's revealed this truth unto us. In fact, here's the, here's the thing. Our world does not need another lesson on how to be happy during happy times. Our world does not need a tutorial on how to be thankful the fourth Thursday of every November. We got that down. I mean, I went to Walmart yesterday. I could hardly get through the spice aisle. I mean, I'm jockey. I punch this old lady in the face. I didn't get to get that. No, I, was, I didn't go that far, but it was an elbow. <laughs> no, I'm just uh, they don't need another lesson on that. They know how to do that. <laughs> you know what our world needs? They need a lesson on joy in bad times. In fact, I find it very interesting that most of the New Testament is written from this perspective. Trials have joy. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this is a trial of faith, work of faith. Uh, I, 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 we see Paul and Barnabas in jail singing, having joy, which leads to someone getting saved because who does that? Most of the New Testament is written to persecuted starving, running for their lives, uncertain about their earthly future, people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ and how through the power of the Spirit they turn the world upside down. So look, joy is not based on our happenings. It's based, it's an inner peace. It's an inner satisfaction. It's an inner quality of life that is produced because what hangs in the walls of our hearts are not the things of our flesh. They're not the fleeting, passing things, mistruths that this world will provide in the bucket loads. <laughs> Joy is produced from the Spirit as he points to Jesus and his sufficiency to us through the very words of God, the very book that sits on your lap. So it doesn't mean you bounce around and skip all your life. But you know, at, at the same time, you know, Psalms chapter 1 says, Blessed, happy, satisfied is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the, uh, with the sinners and the citizens of the seat of the scornful. For his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaf doesn't wither. You know, you, you see someone that has a constant scowl on their face. Who's always had a pessimistic, it's like you walk into the room and you're like, am I, uh, am I in the hundred acre forest with Eeyore or, or is there a Christian in the room? Like what, what gives here? Like, and that's always the way that, that they are. I would question whether they're filled with the spirit because the Bible says when we walk close with him and we're in his word, we're drawing from the strength that comes from it. Like that tree planted by the river, it's going to be bigger. It's going to have more fruit. It's not going to be withery and grumpy and sour and pessimistic. There's a hope that comes from someone who's planted in such a place. This hope that we have in life, it's only as good as the object that you place it in. And that's why we should put it in Jesus, because this hope, the Bible says in Romans 15, maketh not a shame. It's not the idea of, oh, I'm so embarrassed, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm so embarrassed I went to church, although it could eventually get to that point, this word of shame uh, it, it, would, it's, it carries this idea of it doesn't disappoint. It doesn't disappoint. Look, all of us have at one time in our life, we've tried to live our life this way. We, we've tried, hey, this is my life. These are my tools. I mean, I, I bought this stuff. I, I sweated and made, made the check. I got this stuff. It's me. It's my thing. It's I, I'm going to do what I want to do. How does that work for you? How does that play out exactly? Was it as good as you thought it would be? Was it as satisfying as you thought it would be? Oh, man, we, how, how many times in a day do we, do we try to wrestle this sign away from the Holy Spirit and say, no, I don't want to do that. 
I want to do what makes me happy. What are we, three? When we try to live that way, I have no idea if that's actually going to stay up there. Cool. Your faith is only as good as the object that you place it in. You can place your faith in a belief like this. But certainly as we gain more experience in this earth, don't we come to the place where we say, that doesn't work. And that's why Jesus says, look, the, the hope that comes from God's word, that comes from the Christ-centered life, that comes from a life that's pursuing being filled by the Spirit doesn't make a shame. Why? Because the love of God, Romans 5, 5, uh, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. And when we put our hope in what God is and what his word is and what he's done for us, the love of God paints every wall in our heart. God loves me so much. God, God is looking for my best. He's committed to my pleasure. The, the problem is, is when I trade uh, trinkets, okay, of this world for the real treasure that he provides for me. And I think that's going to be better than what I can find in the word of God. But if we put our faith in this, it doesn't make a shame. It doesn't disappoint. It comes through every time. If you were here last week, I can ask you this question. Were you filled with the Spirit last week? Yes or no? You know, you say yes and no. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, like it was like a, a constant kind of back and forth thing. It is. I, I, can, I can take you to a place yesterday standing in my kitchen. I was filled with the Spirit. Okay, there were some truths that I was believing uh, and living out in my life. And then I had a, a child in, that lived in my home, lives in my home. i got to be careful I say that. <laughs> yeah. You're dead to me. I've spoken. <laughs> uh, he said no to me. And he started slowing me down. I had an appointment. We we're going to be late. And if I was late, that would be embarrassing. And it would throw off this part of my day to throw off that part of my day. And I've got my schedule. And I've got these things to do. And people who uh, aren't even teenagers yet could have no possible way of understanding in their brain. And so you're just going to go now. You know, and you can see where this is going as a parent. You, you get it. You know, where, and all of a sudden, instead of, instead of trusting uh, that God's love and grace was enough for me. I thought, man, I've got to grab a hold of this situation and control it and force it to be exactly what I need it to be now because I'm not going to be happy unless it happens this way. Now, do kids need to obey? Yes. That's not the point. The point is I went from a place of having the Spirit fill that wall in my heart to ripping that sign off the wall and throwing up my own sign. I don't know what it said. I don't know if you want to read it. But I was not filled with the Spirit. So was I filled with the Spirit? Yes. Uh, and no. <laughs> uh, the, the thing is, in that, and that's going to be the, every week for the rest of my life. There's this constant battle. There's this spiritual war that goes on uh, where, between my flesh and the Spirit. These two are contrary, the one with the other, so that we cannot do the things that we would, the Bible says. We can't just go, oh, well, it's just a battle. I can't do nothing about it. No. Our, our job is... To be filled with the Spirit. The command is to be filled with the Spirit. And so uh, we have got to learn to recognize those signs that should not be there. Take them down and allow God through the Spirit to put up the signs uh, that should be there. We need to quickly change the sign. You know, like as fast as we can. As soon as we recognize that, that doesn't belong here. That's out of place. We've got to put the right thing back up. Now. Quit looking at me like I'm the only one that does this, all right? I got a lot of feedback this week uh, from me the message the week before, which I'm super thankful for. I'm just going to, you know, there's no one here but us, so we can just kind of be low-key about this today. Uh, I'm curious if you can think of a sign this week that your flesh, that the world, 
that the devil may have provided for you to put on the walls of your heart, thus making you not filled with the Spirit. All right? Here, here, let me give you one, just as a practice. I can already see that we're going to get this awkward part of the sermon where I talk and you stare, and this is kind of weird. So, um, so like this week, I'm in Walmart. And man, now, it's not even Thanksgiving yet. You know how this goes, and all the Christmas stuff is out. And I'm getting these emails, Black Friday deals, and this is going on. And like, oh man, and, I, and, and so I, I didn't share this. I shared something different in the first service. I'll go this way with it. So in my house, I have a 37-inch flat screen TV that I bought uh, when I turned 30 years old. It's going to be many years old tomorrow, and uh, <laughs> it'll, be, <laughs> it'll be nine years old tomorrow. You know, a couple weeks ago, my wife said to me, I think we need a new TV. And I, and I, I mean, I died of a heart attack. She revived me, and I was like, <laughs> what? Like, I've never, I thought, man, it's been 15 years of marriage, and finally I've made some improvements around here, you know. Uh, I, I've, I've rubbed off her a little bit, you know. Uh, she was getting kind of dark, and I think we could just get it. It's like, okay. So now, guess what I was doing this week? You know, I'm looking at deal, like, oh, Black Friday email, like, type in TV, like, look at the deals, the size, the screen, like, all this stuff, and uh, and, I'm, and I'm thinking, like, oh, I could get that. And so, oh, that one's, a, that one's $170. That's a pretty good deal. I think I could, I could swing, I could get that. Uh, and, and then, like, and then, like, you turn the page, and you're like, oh, that one's a little bigger. That one's a little nicer. Like, you know, like, that one's only $450, you know, and it has this and this and this. You know, so like, you start going there. You know, you, you know where this is going, don't you? Before you realize it, you're, like, looking at these TVs that are, like, $1,000, and you're, like, Man, I wish I could have one of those because it's like so cool. And then, like somewhere in that weird mind of yours, if you're not careful, you can start to like turn it, not just like I don't have this, but like you can actually turn this thing to cause you to rebel against God, to hate God, to not have the love of God shed abroad in your heart and say, how does that happen exactly? Well, all of a sudden you're thinking, man, if I had a better job, you know, or... Man, if, if my, my wife would quit swiping the debit card, we could, you know, and it's, I mean, she just went to buy groceries and mac and cheese, and you're like, you're like, now you're, and, and now you start getting like, you know, you're going to maybe get a little grabby about all the, you know, things. Why, why, where is that coming from? And it is, it's all because you have this little idol now in your head. You have this little sign on your heart that says you're not happy unless you have this kind of TV. And man, you think, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay extra at work. I'm going to go hard. I'm going to get some over. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with staying extra and working hard and being the best and getting overtime. But why? See what I'm saying? Uh, and, and it's one thing to just do it with like one TV in, in your heart and your life. But some of us, we go from pursuit to pursuit to pursuit to pursuit in our life this way. Because we're trying to fill that space in our heart that only Jesus will fill. That the Spirit is trying to fill so desperately with the things that are true. But we keep slapping up lies on the wall. And and so at some point, we're like flipping through there, and where I went from a place of being filled with the Spirit, of being in love with God for all He's done for me, at the back of the magazine, I am totally upset with Him because I'm such a loser because I don't have the kind of job that I can just go out and buy a random $1,000 TV anytime I want. What is His problem? No longer filled with the Spirit. So, that happened to me this week. What happened to you? There's nobody here but us. What? Oh my goodness! How dare they? And, and they let you drive it. That's so funny. Yeah. Anything wrong with Teslas? Uh, no, no, wait. That's a, 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 a bad question to ask. Everybody has an opinion about those sort of things. No. It's a car. But how can a Tesla cause me to be not filled with the Spirit and be walking in my flesh? Well, probably for a lot of the same reasons I just described up here. You know, we go, yeah. <laughs> and we go through this process, and it's, and it's okay to wrestle with that. Uh, we're flesh. We wrestle, we wrestle these spiritual wars that go on constantly in our life. It's okay if we wrestle with it, okay? If we put it back in its place, if we tear it off, the, they're going to get thrown up there, and we just got to tear them down, put up, the, put up the right thing. Very good, Rob. That's the first positive contribution you've made to the service <laughs> in a long time. It's usually negative. It's usually, you know, you're the, uh, Rob, thank you. Anybody else with me and Rob? Maybe just. I, uh, oh. I uh, was, uh, dealing, was, uh, was dealing a ride home from work the other night. It was actually good for me. I was, I was really thankful. Maybe because I finally, maybe it was finally killing me on my driver's side. 
<laughs> All right, very good. Yeah, you think about having to walk to work. Hey, some people at our church walk to work. If you had to walk to work every day, I would imagine that on one of those walks, there would be a time where you'd be tempted to not like God and to be disappointed with God's will and God's provision for you in that moment in that time. So that could be a struggle. You, you were going to say something? Okay. Oh, you poor thing. Yeah, that was so sad. This guy is, is he's with the, uh, I'm going to ask the Chinese Christians to pray for you too, the ones that are praying for the Chick-fil-A people. Uh, if you've seen the Babylon Bee article this week. Now, I know what you're saying though. You know, yeah, so there's some, there's some uh, physical things, especially we live, in, in, as Americans, we live in this society where, man, it, it's, that's the thing I think where God works where our flesh just is so quick to grab us in, as Americans. We just, look, there will always be another one, a new addition, the next thing. And somewhere you just have to draw the line. Somewhere you just have to say, this is, this is good. God has provided. And if, and if next year or next day he gives you and provides something that's newer, nicer, bigger, better, better, great. But it doesn't mean he hates you the day before. No, he's given everything to us. It, it, Romans 8 says, he's spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with his son freely give us all things? Like he's already given us the most valuable possession that he has. He's not holding anything else back, trying to jip you off or rip you off. Like he's giving everything that we need, everything that's good for us. Uh, he's providing. He's providing for us. Very good. Anybody? Maybe. Maybe something that isn't uh, like like we've all shared things that were sort of a material possession thing. Any anybody that would maybe something you thought of outside of that, where you say, "Man, this is." Uh, I wrestle with this this week. Yeah. not trying to be Pollyanna here for, sorry for the like 50 year old mo movie reference for the younger <laughs> folks but like you know it's, it's not this idea that oh we just got, oh this is great poke me in the eye again like we're not be trying to be dumb with this but like the truth is like right away and I know you've already thought this but like praise God I've got some neighbors that I know who will let me come and shower otherwise I'd be the stinky new neighbor in the neighborhood You're like <laughs> you know that's not cool uh, you know but like but isn't it so true that like, what goes up in your heart is, like, you know, if God really loved you, he wouldn't allow you to go through this. <laughs> well, what, while, while another dozen people in some third world country lost their life for the cause of Christ, and we've got to go to our neighbors to take a, a warm shower from running water. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and I, I probably as a mirror, I've every, every country in context deals with this in their own ways. Uh, ours just seem super petty sometimes, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, hey, as, as a person... Uh, who has had to go fetch my own water uh, in the last couple months when I went to Africa. I, I get it. I get it. Um, but God is still good. And you just, I want you to see the battle that happens inside your brain, inside your head. So some of us aren't aware of it. Man, we just pull down the spirit signs and we throw up the flesh signs all the time and they have plastered our walls for too long that we don't even recognize the difference. Okay, we don't even realize the Spirit doesn't fill our life. I'm doing all the things. I'm going to, I'm a part of the city. I, I helped with the out thing, and I'm going to the in thing next week. You know, how does that not? Because you're doing it all wrong. You're doing it backwards. And it's so easy, it's so easy to do. Man, I could spend the rest of our time uh, with, with uh, talking through some of those things, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. Uh, but I, I, I wanted to stop and do that because I think you, I, I hope it helps. <laughs> Number one, you're not alone. We all, we all struggle with these sort of things. Um, and, and how do I get, uh, you know, how do I get back on track? We're going to look at that here uh, in, in just a second. So the, love, the, the joy of God that comes from the Spirit as he points to Jesus through the Word of God fills me with hope, fills me with joy, 
fills me with love. Colossians 1, chapter 4, uh, four says this. Since Paul says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have had for all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof we heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. He says, he says, you, he says we heard about your story. We heard about your testimony. You had love for all the saints. Man, you were kind and generous and helping and giving, even when maybe you didn't have all that to give. How did that happen exactly? He says it's because you had a hope which was laid up in heaven. Then you had a hope that was laid. There's something, my hope, my confidence, my focus, my attention is up in heaven. It's not down here in all these earthly, fleshly things. And so I'm able to have love for other people because, because there's something in heaven that I'm holding on to. There's something in heaven that's true. There's something that, that God has already, he's already given me all the love and grace that I need uh, in my life. So I don't have to run around being stingy and grabby and trying to uh, get everything for me. God's taking care of me so that I can be that conduit of grace and love for him in giving out to others. That's what Paul saw in the Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. And the list goes on. But we see our items that we're talking about right there up in the front. This isn't something you can manufacture, Okay. You can serve in a ministry in this church until the cows come home, and you will not be filled with the Spirit. Because serving in a ministry does not fill you with the Spirit. Unless it's the last step of obedience to the hope that has been revealed to us from the Spirit in the Word, in the word of God. What do we hope in? Psalm 42 and verse 5. Why art thou cast down on my soul? And why are you disquieted within, why are thou disquieted within me? The psalmist says, soul, self, brain, thinking, why are you cast down? Why are you disquieted? Why are you depressed? Why are you discouraged? What are you anxious about? Why such the worry? How do we fix that? He says to his soul, hope thou in God. Hope thou in God. The answer is, To the frustrations, the anxiety, the regret, the worry, the God doesn't love me because he doesn't give to me like I want him to give to me. Hey, why don't you give your kids everything they ask for? Because you what? Because you love them. Yeah, I, would, I don't want to spoil them. That's why God doesn't do that for us too because he loves us because he doesn't want to spoil us and so when our soul is depressed when our soul is disquieted we are told to hope in God okay I get it down with self down with the pictures uh, of me up with Jesus up with the Bible the scriptures but how do I fill my mind how do I fill my heart with this first of all you got to drink you got to drink Ephesians 5 18 our, our verse okay be not drunk with wine or in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. All right, I, I believe all my heart that verse has, is not trying to say yes or no to anybody drinking alcohol beverages. I, I really think that was sort of the last thing on Paul's mind and the Holy Spirit's mind when this verse was written. I'm going to throw this little thing in way off out of context, way out of side, to give somebody the excuse or the reason to just do whatever they want when it comes to alcohol. Another series, another subject. But here's the point. Be filled with the Spirit. How do we be filled with the Spirit? Drink. Just like a guy, just like a person would have to just kick it back and drink alcohol. Now, now not like in our days, like there could be some beverages you could, you know, get, uh, you could get intoxicated in just a few moments. You know what I mean? In Paul's day, this was a, a process. He had to really put back some drinks in order to make this happen. Because the alcohol content was so low in even what they would consider alcohol back in these days. But what happens when someone's intoxicated? They, they don't act like they usually do. They don't talk like they usually do. They treat people differently. I mean, all, who knows what happens because they're not in control anymore, uh, the alcohol. Is. And that's the point of the verse. Is that if we're filled with the Spirit, something's wrong with that guy. He doesn't normally act that way. I've never heard him talk like that before. Where is he going? What is he doing over there? What in the world? It's like he's not even in control of himself. Yeah, because the Spirit of God is in control. The Spirit of God 
is the one calling the shots. But we have to drink that. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for, the, uh, for by one spirit we're all baptized in the one body, whether the Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, uh, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. In John 7, verse 37, in the last day, the great uh, day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake, and this is in parentheses, it's kind of a side note that the author puts in here. But this he spake of the spirit which they uh, that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. See, Jesus said this, and then he ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit came, and then John writes that book of the Bible after those things. So as he's writing this book of the Bible, he says, uh, just so you understand, Jesus wasn't at this point that I'm writing about. Jesus hadn't gone yet. The Spirit hadn't come. But what Jesus was talking about was the Spirit. If you, come, if you thirst, come to me and drink. And out of your belly, out of the inner parts of your life will flow rivers of water because the Spirit of God now lives inside of there. Now, in order to, to drink, we must think. Think to drink. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not as simple as just coming to church and just shutting the brain off. I'm here. I was there. Okay, we got to think to drink. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. And they that are after the spirit do mind the things of the spirit. Uh, in Colossians chapter 3, it says, uh, If you are risen with Christ, are you saved? Great. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now, I want to set my affections on things above, and not on things of the earth. So you're, like, you're like, wait a minute, I don't, I don't want to mind spiritual things. I don't want to set my affections on things of above. Like, I want a bigger TV. I want a newer thing. I want a Tesla. I want a back porch. I want a thing. Like, and, 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 you know, we, we can kind of, and it was like, I don't even care about God. And I'm not suggesting these people that spoke out today don't care about God. I know they do. But you're like, some of us are sitting here and we're like, I'm here because my wife, maybe my spouse, maybe, or I just, this is what I do on Sunday morning. But the truth is, I want to live for me. I don't want the Holy Spirit signs on my wall. I want my signs on my wall because I want to do my thing. I don't even care. I mean, if I cared a little bit more about spiritual things, if I was at that point in my life, if it really mattered, then maybe I might try that. But I just really don't really have an appetite. Well, the reason you don't is because you don't mind it. You don't mind it. You know... <laughs> You know what I've been thinking about a lot lately? TV. Not like a full-time job or anything, but this week, in some of my spare time, I've been minding TVs. Minding TVs, what do you mean? Oh man, I'm, I'm searching, looking for the ad, I'm thinking about it. I want to know what the difference, what's this OLED thing all about? You know, that's a sort of a new one, you know, and, and some are like, yeah, it's been out for two years, this guy's way behind, I know, I'm way behind. <laughs> so you're like, uh, what is it? And we're t I'm talking to someone, they're like, yeah, I don't know, how big is it supposed to be in a room? Like, there's a calculation, we gotta find it, and now, and oh, now we know the calculations, how to make, you know, the right size, and we're, and we're sort of all into it, why? Because we've been minding it. My wife had her surgery a couple weeks ago, I brought her home and set her in the recliner, this old person recliner, that, hi babe, uh, that we, we rented so she can stand up like this, and we sat her down the front of the TV, and she's like, I'm just not into anything. I just don't like that. I'm like, oh, watch this. I watched this series, and this is great. You'll love it. And she's like, yeah, I'm not really interested. I just, I just can't seem to get into anything. And I, I mean, I went so far as to get a seven-day free trial for the Brit Box, okay, on my Amazon Prime. So just thinking maybe there's something in there, uh, you know, that she would, she would like. Uh, and, and so we found this series. You can ask my wife about it. She'll probably tell you about it next time she sees you anyway. But... Um, I said, let's just watch this. So we sat down, and we watched the first episode. And the, the whole time we're watching the episode, I'm watching. I'm, I'm falling asleep. I'm falling asleep. Like, no one's dying. There's no fast cars. There's nothing. It's like <laughs> from 300 years ago. Uh, and I'm looking at my wife, and I'm watching her. And guess what happened? I could just started getting into it. Oh, and what's going to happen to them? Or is she going to marry that guy? Are they going to, oh, and they, the love note, there goes the love note. You know, like all those little things. Uh, and those kind of movies that my wife, my wife loves, and I fall asleep somewhere in the night, and the next day uh, I go to work, you know, come back, and, and she goes, thanks a lot. And I'm like, what? She goes, 
I'm into it. She goes, I guess, uh, she goes I'm, uh, I'm like, this is great. Because my wife never does this. And we've got to get through the recovery days of the surgery. So please put your mind wherever it needs to be so that we can, so you can just go through the days of it. And she's like, hooks. She's like, and, and yesterday I came in the living room. I'm telling you, I've, I, I've seen this less than this many times in my life. I came in the living room and my wife has her cell phone. And she's over on the couch. And I hear this little noise. And she's over there watching trying to watch the show. We got kids jumping around, things go, you know, things going on. And she's like, into it. And I'm like, great, this is awesome because I'm usually the couch potato, you know? So I'm like, it's great that it's you. This is wonderful. How did she get into it so much? Here, here's how. She minded it. She put her mind there. She went there. She spent some time with it. She got interested a little bit in the lives of these actors and the, the roles they're playing, how word and the words they say so fancy that we as uh, Americans uh, slaughter, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and she's just totally into it. Some of you need to do that with spiritual things. I know you're not really into it today. I get it. I've been there. But you know what? If you would mind it, <laughs> if you'd put your mind on it for a while, if you'd invest some actual of your time into it, if you would, if you'd try to dig out from it a little bit what God wants for you and what it says and understand and begin to understand this most incredible plot that has ever been written. The most amazing love story that will ever be told. Uh, the, the most incredible thing that there was this wicked, murderous, adulterating, filthy, vile human being that a God, the God, the creator God came to earth and died in his place, took his punishment for him. And not only that, but it rose back and went to heaven and now is providing through the spirit all, all of these hundreds of blessings into the line so that they can fight uh, this eternal battle between good uh, and evil. My friend, if you would just mind that for a moment, you might be a little more in to what God is right now doing in all the world. They that are of the flesh mind the things that are flesh. No kidding. These are all the signs that hang in your heart. Because that's all you ever mind. That's all you ever do. You're here, yeah. But you're not really here. You've read your Bible last week, but you didn't really read your Bible. I, I, I know you prayed with your spouse before you went to bed. But it doesn't count if you're trying to figure out your fantasy football team. And pray at the same time. You know what I mean? Like, there's a difference. That's all I'm trying to say. We've got to mind. We've got to think to drink. And then the really the last step is this, is that faith fills. Faith fills. Look, you can know all the verses. <laughs> you could get up and preach the sermon. But unless you actually live it, unless you actually treat it like it's real, unless you actually believe it enough to change your life, to tear down the sign and put up the right one and live by it, you're not filled with the Spirit, you understand? Because that happens when there is obedience. The, the Spirit fills us with hope when we see it. God is good. God loves me even though I don't have a back porch. <laughs> even though I have a dark 37-inch TV, God still loves me. God's still good, just like he was yesterday before I realized my wife needed a new TV. You know, like, and he's still good. I don't have to complain about God. I, and man, I'm going to let this truth hold me. I'm going to let this truth fill me. I'm going to let this truth motivate me and help me. I'm going to base decisions in my life off this truth that God is good, that God provides, that God gives daily bread, that no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Those are the signs that should hang in the walls of our hearts. Faith will fill our life with the Spirit if we mind the things of the Spirit. What are the things of the Spirit? 1 Corinthians 2.14 The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can uh, they be known of him, because they are spiritually discerned. What are the things of the Spirit? They're the things of God. That context in, in 1 Corinthians 2 says it's the revelation of God, the Word of God. John 6, 63, the spirit quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words which I speak unto you, Jesus said, they are spirit, their life. Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, uh, thinking that we through patience or that endurance remaining, staying, and 
comfort that comes by what? By the scriptures. What will happen? We might have hope. We might have the hope. Where do we get it? How do we get it there? It comes through the scriptures, the things of the spirit that we must think on, that we must mind, that we must put ourselves and apply it there. Where do we think that we get a pass just because it is a little hard? Well, it's kind of difficult. It wasn't as easy as the paint by numbers thing at the Dollar Tree. Like, do you think God's going to, oh, okay, I understand. No, <laughs> he, he, he wrote it in a way that it could be understood, that it could be helped, and he gave you the spirit inside of you to do so. Through the scriptures we have hope. What's the hope? The confidence that the stupendous future promised to us by God through the word of the spirit is going to really come true. So we think to drink and be filled. We get that through preaching, through reading our Bible, through memorization, through applying, through searching out uh, matters of the spirit, through rehearsing those truths to ourselves and to others by believing uh, and by obeying. I told you about this last week, but I brought a picture this week. It's a picture of my garage. Doesn't everybody's garage look like that? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. My garage looks 100 times better than it used to. And that's because you can't see the other three walls. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it all looks about that orderly. It's not because of me. In fact, when it was my garage... Uh, and it still technically is by name, um, uh, when I was in charge of it, things were everywhere, and things were disorganized, uh, and the floor was yucky because it wasn't painted, and the wall was just the drywall with the mud, you know, the mud from the seams, uh, and that was it. And then one day my wife came in, and she took control of the garage. Now look, I know some of you joked with me last week about losing my man card. And I'll admit, some of this process physically was hard for me. You know, like, I'm just like, wait a minute, I got, I got any, like, I, you know, I, I help pay for this house too. You know, like, those sort of things that you kind of grow. But every day I drive into that garage, and like, actually one of our vehicles can fit in it now, you know, like that kind of garage. You see those brown cabinets? My shoes are in them. Every one of them. And they fit in there. And we, I don't even have to ask my wife anymore, where are my shoes? Because there's a place for the shoes that she, she created, and they're there, and the whole thing is, is wonderful. It's even better when we actually put our stuff back in there, at least for her. Um, it's an improvement over what I was doing with the walls of my garage. I'm just trying to go to any length that I can to explain to you that, <laughs> that your way of decorating <laughs> the walls of your heart is never going to be superior to God's. He is trying to improve your life. He's not trying to take something out of it. Catch this word. He's trying to fill it. Fill it with what? Promises and truth. Why is that important? Because uh, you're, you're, if, if, if we're decorating our heart, we have empty promises and lies that hang on the walls of our heart. And God says, that's a lie. That won't work out. That won't produce what you want. Get rid of that garbage and put, put this up. You're, you, you don't belong to you. It's not your garage. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify your Father, which is in heaven with your body and your spirit. Glorify Him. You're the, you're the temple of the living God. And that's a truth you can hang on your wall of your life and never regret believing it. Never regret living it. When I think about the different people in our church today, I'm aware that there are some old people in this room. I'm going to be 39 tomorrow, so I'm getting closer to you guys all the time. I, I mean, it's getting up there. What kind of signs do old people hang on the walls of their heart? I was a little nervous to answer this question, to be quite honest, but you know that from what I understand, and as I talk to old people, they have, they have different fears than someone who's 39 has. They worry about their health. I mean, every ache and pain could be the, the one, the big one that they've been, you know, waiting on, and, and it's going to be over. Their spouse, and are they, is the spouse going to be there tomorrow, and will 
they be lonely? Will the money that they've saved, will it, will it, will it last till, till, they, till they die? It, if something happens to them, what will their kids do? Because even at 70, 80 years old, some of them are still holding their children together because their children have lived sort of this way most of their life instead of for God, and they're trying to help keep them uh, in, a, in a stable situation. What about teenagers? Who are the teenagers in this room? What, you know, every once in a while, I'm aware of this, that every once in a while teenagers get frustrated with their parents, like every minute or so. You know, I just think it's a, it sort of happens every once in a while in, in your life. Man, there's peer pressure that comes into a teen's life. Can you imagine how many hundreds of signs that people want to hang around the necks of our teenagers every day? Their friends, I, I have someone who's a substitute teacher in a school in a very, very conservative part of Missouri, and he just messaged me the other day. He goes, you should hear what these kids are talking about. They are so lost. They are so confused. They are so messed up. They deal with so many lies from the devil, and they're not even 16. Thousands of signs every week that are thrown at them through the television, that are thrown at them through their friends, that are thrown at them through the world. And I'm just telling you, teenagers, don't take a one of them. Don't buy in to that garbage Get uh, with God's word and allow the spirit to show you what is really true and what is really matters and what will really last and allow the Holy Spirit to hang the signs on your heart. Parents, you got a handful of kids at home, things that revolve around money, kids, work, regret, and guilt. I heard one time that guilt is a mother's middle name. And I think every, we get to the end of every day, and we, did I do it right? Did I say the right things? Did we go the right time? Did I, did I do that too hard? Did I do it too easy? Are they, they going to make it? Are they going to turn out? We just, and and there's, a, there's just this constant uh, battle and uncertainty uh, about it. And man, the world would tell us all the ways to do it uh, and would like us to drown out the voice of God in our life. And if you're married, uh, it could be anger. It could be pride. Could be selfishness, could be just pettiness. You know, they're always fighting about these dumb things that don't even matter. Like, who cares how you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? It doesn't matter. Don't fight about it with your wife. And all the the signs that the ladies from work would love to give to you that aren't true about your husband. Man, all the things that would creep in, uh, maybe of lust and unfaithfulness and of just giving up and of buying the lie from the devil that it just doesn't matter anymore. Single people struggle with loneliness, jealousy, and self-centeredness. This isn't unique necessarily because we all can battle with any of these things at one time. I'm just saying that in a room like just in our second service right here, before the day is out, our flesh and this world and the devil will rush us with hunger of signs to hang on the walls of our heart that just aren't true. They're just not healthy. They will not help us to shut. They fill our heart and mind. And we've got, a, we've got a renovation project that needs to happen where we start allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through us through the word and we take down the lies and we put up the truth so that we can be filled with the Spirit. I've tried to come at this from 45 different angles so that you can grab a hold of this. I hope that even before this day is out, it may be that you would take, take something from here uh, that we've said today and that you and God would, would take the moment to pull that truth, that lie down and put the truth up so it could begin to fill you with hope of what God says about what God's intentions are for your life, about how to live life, about how you should behave, how you should live as a Christian, and it would fill your life with something that matters. It'd fill your life with something you wouldn't be disappointed in because it's been given to us by the maker of life from God himself. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this time. Lord, I'm mentally exhausted. probably circled this ten times even today. 
God, I'm praying that your Holy Spirit would do the thing that I can't do, and that is drive these truths deep into our hearts. Lord, I can suggest the sign, but it really is the individual that would allow the Holy Spirit to hang it on the wall of their heart. Now let's pray that we would just see the goodness, that we'd see the love, that we'd see the passion you have for us. Lord, I hate to think that people in our own church live empty lives filled with ourselves constantly. Lord, I pray for at least a struggle <coughs> between the two. And then we think about truths like greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We can have victory. It's not just a losing battle we're fighting here. We can have victory in the power of the Spirit to live for God, to love God, to shine for others, to come to put their faith in God, to please you with our lives because we are filled with the Spirit of the Christ, the Holy Spirit of God. Friends, I haven't really preached a message that says come forward, make a decision, that sort of thing, but if God spoke in your heart, I pray that you'll take time not just to sing, but to pray. Maybe you want to kneel down front or kneel in your seat. Or if, I, if I'd love to pray with you in the back, I'm going to slip to the back. If I can pray with you, you don't have to be like, oh, I'd, I'd be embarrassed to walk right here. People would think something's wrong with me. But we all have stuff wrong with us. Anybody who doesn't know that is fooling themselves. Let's just take care of business. Let's talk with God. Let's admit our failures. Let's admit our depravity and sinfulness. Let's admit that we've got some things hanging on our walls that shouldn't be there, that we don't want there. Let's beg God to fill us with that hope that comes from the Spirit through the Word so that we can see His joy and His love in our own hearts. Let's stand and sing this song, Lord, I Need You. If God spoke your heart today, let's just take that time to spend with Him. If I can be a help to you, I'll be in the back.